Welcome to special coverage of CBSN Boston's unique and rare interview with two astronauts aboard the International Space Station. I'm Zach Green. And I'm Jacob Wyckoff. In just a couple of minutes, I'll be interviewing Dr. Kate Rubens and Commander Victor Glover. They are standing by and will join us very shortly. Now, both astronauts are not only on the International Space Station, but they've also been named to the team that will pave the way for the next mission to the moon. This mission is appropriately named Artemis, who was the twin sister of Apollo and the goddess of the moon in Greek mythology. The Artemis team has members with incredibly diverse backgrounds from military test pilots to medical doctors and scientists. Among them, a few New England locals like Scott Tingle from Randolph and Stephanie Wilson, born in Boston, and Jessica Meir from Maine. Now, NASA has not yet chosen who will be part of the actual moon landing mission in 2024, but this is a, an exciting process for everyone involved in shaping the future of space travel. Zach? Well, Jacob, while we are still a few years away from Americans returning to the moon, the Artemis mission is flying ahead. This afternoon, the first ever space launch system will conduct its second hot fire test at Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. This is video from the first rocket test that was completed back in January. If all goes well today, the rockets will be sent to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida for the launch of Artemis 1, a crewless mission around the moon that's slated for November. These rockets will be integrated with other major elements like the Orion crew capsule. That's the spacecraft that will eventually bring Americans to the moon. And a little bit about who will we, we will be talking with today. Dr. Kate Rubens is a Connecticut native. She has a very unique background. She has a PhD from Stanford in cancer biology. Before joining NASA, she actually completed a fellowship in Cambridge at MIT's the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research. This isn't her first trip to space either. After joining NASA in 2009, she launched to the International Space Station in 2016 and became the first person to ever sequence DNA in space. On that mission, she spent 115 days orbiting the Earth and did two spacewalks, completing upgrades and doing various other station maintenance. She's currently on a six-month mission as a flight engineer. Also on board is astronaut Victor Glover Jr. He was selected as an astronaut in 2013. As just one of eight elite members in his class, he completed astronaut training in 2015. This is his first trip to space, and he's been orbiting ever since November 15th, 2020. Glover has multiple master's degrees in engineering. Before joining NASA, he was a pilot for the U.S. Navy. He's flown over 40 aircraft. That was over 3,000 hours in the air and also participated in dozens of combat missions back on Earth. This role stationed Glover throughout the country and also Japan. And of course, all attention turned to space recently with a successful landing of another Mars rover, the Perseverance, on February 18th. The nation waited with anticipation for the first sign that the rover had survived its landing. A month later, the world is seeing and hearing the red planet in ways like never before. That's the first audio recording from Mars. In it, you can hear what NASA calls Martian wind. This kind of sounds like Earth wind, too. The <laughs> rover has already taken its first test drive, leaving tire tracks in the red dust, and Perseverance will spend two years on the planet conducting research and looking for signs of life. CBSN News' Carter Evans has a look at what it took to get us here. Everything worked. The heat shield. The parachute and the rocket-powered sky crane that lowered Perseverance down to its new home. Touch on confirmed. Yeah. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars. Minutes after landing, the rover beamed back proof of life. Two black and white photos from the red planet. What was it like seeing those pictures? It was amazing. While he was speaking to us, NASA's acting administrator, Steve Jerzyk, got a call from his boss. Hello, Mr. President. Who watched the landing at the White House. His first words were, congratulations, man. So, you know, that's the president, right? And so he was as psyched as I am. Perseverance is the largest and most advanced rover ever built. It's jam-packed with instruments and experiments like ingenuity. A four-pound helicopter that could prove it's possible to fly on another planet. But the main goal of this $2.4 billion mission is to collect samples that could contain evidence of past life. If this finds proof of life, uh, everybody will say it's a great investment. Thomas Serbukin oversees NASA's science missions. They're all expensive missions, 
And uh, I don't think there's a lot of people that would say, I wish we didn't do that. It changed not only what we know, but how we think about ourselves. And for me, that's ultimately what research is about. But this research will require patience. To answer the question of past life on Mars, these samples first have to get back to Earth. That will take two more expensive missions and at least a decade. Congratulations, but believe it or not, we have a job to do now. <laughs> Carter Evans, Pasadena, California. And we are just a few seconds away from joining Dr. Kate Rubens and also actually uh, Station. This is Jacob Wyckoff from WBZ TV. How do you hear me? Very good. So you are traveling 250 miles above our head <laughs> at a speed of over 17,000 miles per hour. A oh, team great. of seven is aboard the oh, International yeah, right. Space Station. I'm now joined by two of them, Dr. Kate Rubens and Commander Victor Glover. Appreciate you joining us. How are you both? I had to go to the uh, station mic. Okay. So we... Hello, we hear you loud and clear. This there is the we International go. International Space Station. Welcome aboard. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So I mentioned that you guys are orbiting the Earth at about 17,000 miles per hour. So you're going a little fast here. How are you this morning? Doing great. We're actually on uh, London time, so we've been up and at it for a while today, and we've gotten a lot of uh, experiments and station maintenance done already. It's been an awesome day in space. Well, that is awesome. I would say good morning to you, but you mentioned uh, that you're on London time. You see 16 sunrises every day. Uh, what has been the hardest thing adjusting to in space beyond, you know, the lack of gravity? Well, you know, I have a, a family back home, and I say being without them, waking up and going to bed every night without being able to see them physically has been the biggest challenge. But, you know, being up here is a, it's a sacrifice for everyone, and that's been the biggest sacrifice for me. Now, you guys have an incredibly unique perspective. Only about 563 people have ever been in space and even fewer aboard the International Space Station. What's it like to see home, Dr. Glover, or, uh, Commander Glover? You mentioned you see home and you miss your family. What's it like to see home out that window? And does that view ever get old? Okay, first, the view does not ever get old. It is spectacular. I love to be there in the twilight when the sun is coming up or when it's going down. It is just breathtaking and spectacular. But even being over the, we're, we're over the ocean a lot, the open ocean. And as an Navy guy, I really connect with the ocean. But the blue ocean, the beautiful colors of the lands, the plains, the desert, it is just striking to see it as it is and not on a map or seeing a rendition, but with your own eyes at the appropriate scale, it is truly a life-changing view. That really does look incredible there. We have some pictures up on the screen of your guys' view of Earth. Now, the subject of diversity in space and technology is a growing topic. For example, girls are rightfully seeing themselves in lots of future STEM professions. Both of you are big role models to so many. What advice do you have for them as they explore their future? My advice to young women that are interested in science and technology is to, to think about what they're interested in, figure out what grabs them, what do they like to do every day, and hold on to that. There's a lot of people out there that are going to say, hey, this is too hard, you shouldn't be doing this, maybe give you the feeling, uh, not overtly, but give you the feeling subtly that you don't belong here. I mostly just ignored that. I put my blinders on. I do what I love to do. I, I have always had jobs that I think are amazing, incredible, and I'm passionate about that. And so, you know, put your blinders on, put your head down, and do what's fun, and, and do what drives you and what you're passionate about. If you're passionate about something, that's going to take you really far. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to lead you to places you wouldn't even think, like the space station. Such great advice there. So, no. I, I think you can look at the news and read the paper and see that, 
the world needs the best of all of us right now. So I, I don't care how old you are or what you look like. I say these three things because I try to live them myself, and I think it applies to all people. We need to be resilient, gritty. You need to, like Kate said, put your head down and keep your feet moving, not stop in the face of challenges. And the greatest challenges come from within. So don't, don't stop. We need to be lifelong learners, learning inside the classroom and outside the classroom. And we also need to work on being good teammates or good members of the community, working together so that we can solve those great challenges that are facing all people. Such great advice there. Now, the Mars 2020 mission, Perseverance, landed exactly one month ago to obviously incredible fanfare. What was the reaction like aboard the International Space Station? Did you guys watch it like, you know, a Super Bowl party or something? what we did. We had it. We had the NASA channel streamed live up here. Um, we were in Node 1 where we eat dinner. We're all gathered uh, around the television set. We were watching people at, at JPL. Uh, our hearts were in our throats, I think, like, like everybody else watching it live. It was absolutely incredible. And then a few days later, one of our crewmates pulled up video. If you guys haven't seen the video of the landing, it's um, I, I mean, you theoretically know that we're landing something on Mars, but it's different to see it. It was, it was breathtaking. It was absolutely amazing. Now, from Mars to the moon, there are a lot of future missions planned, like the follow-up to the Apollo mission, the Artemis mission. That's the return of manned missions to the moon. I know both of you are in the Artemis pool of potential astronauts. Are you excited for those possibilities, and what would that bring to the future of space travel? You know, NASA wants to go back to the moon, but to stay, and that's very important so that we have a sustainable presence in lunar orbit, uh, but then it also helps us lay the path to getting onto Mars uh, and becoming a two-planet species. I think the, the goals that we have in the Artemis program are, are amazing. Listen, when, when humanity accomplishes something amazing, what do we call it? One term is a moonshot, and I think it's our generation's turn to see that in person, to watch our generation accomplish something that great. Uh, this is a great accomplishment, the space station. We need to come up with a new term. But to, to see humanity go back to the moon is something that I think, again, could galvanize all people uh, as we do something great for all of humanity. Now, both of you are veterans in doing spacewalks or EVAs. Commander, I know you did one on Saturday morning. And Dr. Rubens, I know you've done one. I think the last one you did was on March 5th. What is it like to leave the station and kind of leave the safety of the station? But also, what are some of the risks involved? Spacewalks are quite a thing. It takes the entire crew to get ready for them, so it's not just people in the spacesuits. It's those that are putting them in the suits, and we actually are in the suits for about four or five hours before we even depress and go out to vacuum. Uh, the suits are amazing. They're their own spacecraft, so they provide thermal cooling for the astronaut. They provide protection from temperatures from minus 200 to plus 200. Um, obviously, they have to provide micrometeorite debris and their own source of oxygen. Uh, they're really incredible, capable vehicles. And then you also have a human inside them moving. So there's a lot of things to keep track of. Um, we really pay attention to every single detail when we put people in the suits, when we go to vacuum, and then we bring them back inside. Uh, it is truly incredible to see after a spacewalk, uh, we're able to look out the windows, and, and Ike and I can both look out at P6 to all the things that we installed, and uh, I, I look out there every now and then, and I'm, I'm really glad I took some extra time with some of the MLI blankets, and I made them look nice and pretty, because once you put it out there in vacuum of space, it's not moving. So it's an incredible experience, uh, but it's also something that we approach very rigorously. Dr. Rubens, I know that you arrived in mid-October of last year just as a busy hurricane season was slowing down a little bit. Have you seen any memorable storms that kind of stick out in your mind? Yeah, we do. We always watch when we're going over Houston. We watch the Gulf Coast and we watch Florida. Uh, we haven't seen anything uh, that's particularly poignant and out of the norm over the U.S., but it is really interesting on the space station to watch weather patterns across the globe. So we do watch for things like typhoons, 
And one of the things that's so striking to me is to see how a weather pattern will develop on one side of the world, and then you can watch it a few days later as it comes across the globe. Because we're going around the Earth so frequently, you kind of notice when there's a really big storm somewhere, or, or even you, you can see the jet stream. You can see uh, as these clouds are forming. That's the most spectacular and, and notable thing. We, we see storms up here all the time, but to watch them move across the planet is I think it's a different scale. And uh, before I leave you guys, I know it's important to exercise two hours a day. What is your favorite zero gravity move? Listen, deadlifts are awesome on Earth. They're also awesome in zero gravity. Uh, we have an amazing machine up here. One of my favorite machines up here is our advanced resistive exercise device. It allows us to, to do the moves you do with, you know, when you're weightlifting, even though we can't use weights. It uses a vacuum cylinder to, uh, to create the resistance, and uh, deadlifts are, are awesome in microgravity. You can really focus on form. I guess I'm not going to get a flip out of you guys, but uh, I appreciate your time. Dr. Kate Rubens, Commander Victor Glover, thank you so much for your time. Be safe and Godspeed to you guys. Now, oh, oh, there they go. There they, <laughs> there they go. I love it. Well, the space station will be passing over our heads this evening. Unfortunately, it does look like there will be some clouds that are going to be blocking our view. Next time you see New England, guys, if you could still hear me, wave down to us. We'll be waving back to you. Thank you for joining us here on CBSN for this special interview with astronauts aboard the International Space Station. We will be right back.